Welcome to Layer of the Alchemist, and uh, welcome to a special edition here. This is a new series that I'm going to call Rank Them If You Got Them. This is where we're going to take all kinds of different things, and we're going to be ranking them. And for this first uh, special episode, I have some real special guests with, with me here. Uh, Jeff and Jay from the Judas Priest podcast, Judas Priest Cast. Uh, this is an excellent, excellent podcast. I've, I've said for the longest time, this is a void in the podcast world. It's shocking that there's nobody with the with the Judas Priest cast. So when I came across these guys, I was just I was just so excited. So uh, great podcast, guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. We are going to be you may say to yourself, well, what are we going to be ranking? We're going to be ranking the return of Rob era, the reunion era Judas Priest albums for everybody who hears me do Iron Maiden. You hear me refer to the Rob era of Iron Maiden, which is return of Bruce. But here we are in the <laughs> ROR, Roar era, the return of uh. Rob. So I thought it would be fun. You know, they, they just put out a new Invincible Shield came out that long ago. And it's kind of fun here to see how it affects everybody's ranking so I, I thought that man i gotta get these guys on i love their podcast uh so so this is great so guys thank you so much for joining me here at the lair oh it's thank a pleasure you so much for having us on this is an absolute pleasure your your uh, youtube channel has been, has had some incredible stuff on it i just recently watched uh your doom metal history videos and they were incredible oh yeah that was a fun one that was a lot of fun so awesome so guys tell, tell me about the uh tell everybody out there about the the podcast well, it's a it's a fans podcast mainly. Um, we we took over for our good friend uh, George, uh, and he initially had started the Metal Gods podcast. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the same guy. Uh, then he moved on to the Judas Priest cast with his uh, co-host Hattie, and they had a good run there. And George decided he wanted to go in a different direction, so. We asked if we could take over the Judas Priest cast because, as you said, there is a void there. Uh, there are, you know, probably 10 Iron Maiden podcasts. There yeah. are podcasts for different bands, you know, all over uh, streaming. Um, so I didn't want the Judas Priest cast to end because I was a big fan with George and Hattie there. Um, so he was gracious enough to let us continue on the podcast. Um, but like I said, it's it's a fan podcast. Um, we are by no means experts on Judas Priest. We're learning uh, along the way um, and hopefully teaching people along the way. Uh, now we have kind of a great dynamic. Um, I've been a lifelong Judas Priest fan. Um, they are my favorite band. Uh, I started listening when I was nine years old. You know, I'm in my 50s now. Uh, they've always meant the world to me. And uh, Jeff is a fairly newer Judas Priest fan, but Jeff knows a lot about music where I kind of lack in, in, in that. Um, I know some about Judas Priest and I'm learning as we go, um, but I don't know a whole lot, lot about music uh, in general other than you know the metal I, I listened to growing up, uh, whereas Jeff fills that void. Uh, um, Jeff may not be the biggest priest fan in the world, but he's a huge fan of music. So we do discuss a lot of different music uh, on the Judas Priest cast. It is Judas Priest centric, of course, um, but we do discuss a lot of other music. Uh, we have a lot of different segments uh, on the priest cast. Um, we, for lack of a better word, play games. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the segments we have is uh, called Tidized to Metalized, <laughs> which goes through the the uh, four eras of priests. We, Although they've been around over 50 years, we uh, categorized it in four eras. It just makes it easier. Yeah. 70s, 80s, including Painkiller, um, because that fits better in the 80s. Yeah. Rob left after Painkiller. Uh, and then the 90s Ripper. and early 2000s is kind of a, a void there. So, you know, we have the Ripper albums, we have all the solo albums and the fight, uh, you know, the Halford too. Sure. all those are incorporated. Uh, and then, of course, we have the reunion era. So we break it down in four eras and then we pick a subject uh, that we that kind of pertains to priest or doesn't necessarily have to. But we, we pick some uh, priest songs from every era that pertain 
to the subject that we're discussing. Uh, so in any episode, you're going to get uh, a number of different priest songs throughout a number of different priest eras. Uh, that's a rotating segment we do every once in a while. We have a priest charcuterie board, which is real fun. <laughs> you know, a, yeah. a cheesy priest song, a meaty priest song, <laughs> a fruity priest song. Uh, and then we can it. incorporate any anything else that goes on a charcuterie board we can incorporate that and mix it in with priest um last time we did battle of the nines which is uh we categorized seven priest albums uh that have nine tracks you know you have to mix and match a little uh heli and electric eye counted as one you know and so on so there are seven albums with nine priest tracks so we spun a little wheel uh and picked two albums to fight have an album battle right there <laughs> so that was fun uh other things like that i can't remember off the top of my head all the things we've done but a staple on our broadcast is the spinner which is a, a play on the center um but it's the spinner uh oh, yeah, to where yeah, we have uh yeah we have a, a, year, a right yes yes we have a wheel that goes from 1974 to present uh, and has a year, you know, all the years on the wheel. Of course, 1974 being the release of Rockerola, Judas Priest's mm -hmm. first album. Uh, and then it lands on a, on a certain year. And then we pick an album uh, from any artist or any genre that was released in that year that we want to discuss. Um, so One of you know, Jay's wildest choices was No Doubt. It shocked the hell out of me. I was bored <laughs> when he chose that one. <laughs> I like I like that record. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we always have, uh, interesting picks. Um, and then we try to relate, uh, the band or album that we picked, uh, with Judas Priest. And sometimes that works, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but we have a lot of fun with that. We surprise each other with a lot of different, uh, musical picks, a lot of different genres, a lot of different, uh, tastes in music. Um, of course we always have a guest, um, so the guest contributes with with their pick. So that's a lot of fun. And, and that way we explore a lot of different music and a lot of different genres, not just Judas Priest, but we do concentrate on Priest, of course. Um, we always have a guest, uh, which is fun. We learn their Judas Priest story. Yeah, uh, I love that. Yeah, their likes and dislikes, uh, their history in, in music and and their stories related therein. So we have a lot of fun. Um, we are, you know, like I said, by no means experts. So we're we're teaching each other and we're learning along with some of our guests that uh, have awesome memories and and awesome information that we may not know. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun, and I'm I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's fun. I love hearing people tell their stories. I know you had somebody on on recently, and I could just tell that he was like it was an almost identical story to me, you know, where he came into it. And, you know, if you're around a certain age, you know, that it's going to affect, uh, you know, where you came into the band and stuff like that. So Jeff, you're, 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 you're a little bit newer to Judas Priest then. So what was your first Judas Priest record then? Newer. I mean, I've uh, been a fan, I guess, for 30 years. I got into okay. him at Painkiller. Okay. But it was interesting. So I listened to Painkiller. I had been familiar with some of the more radio-friendly songs okay. that had been played, and I didn't really like them. So I heard Painkiller and was blown away. Like, to Touch of Evil and, and Painkiller were on MTV, Headbangers Ball all the time. I was like, okay, gotta get this album. I get the album. And I love the entire album. Like, one through ten, or one through nine, it's just a kick-ass album. And then the next album, I uh, went to... Went to Tower Records, went to go get the most recent album closest to Pain to Painkiller. Uh -oh. And the only one they had was Turbo. Uh-oh. <laughs> I actually <laughs> this could be a topic of another episode where we could talk about Turbo. I but yeah, that's I say this all the time. Like if if you it it, it depends on where you come in on a band. And if you grab Turbo or ram it down and that's your first Judas Priest record, then that can really affect how you view the rest. And it may turn you off or 
you may not even, it's like with Black Sabbath, I do a Black Sabbath podcast and uh, we say this all the time, like we we have people message us, it was like, oh, my first Black Sabbath album was Headless Cross or one of the Tony Martin albums. And, and they're like, I can't stand the Ozzy era, you know, because they came into it through Tony Martin. So yeah, I can see going from Painkiller, I mean, what was your reaction when you put Turbo and <laughs> you're expecting Painkiller part two problem? Oh, these albums are close to each other in years. This is probably just like Painkiller, right? Right. Uh, I was done. That was literally the end of my Judas Priest fandom right then and there. I was like, okay, painkiller. It was like a supernova. It rose, it blew up. <laughs> painkiller, woo, and then turbo. <laughs> yeah, so it took me probably 10, 15 years before somebody else convinced me to start listening to the 70s stuff, and I loved it. I this is the greatest really band in the world. This is the worst band in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, just didn't really pay attention to it until about five years ago. I got into the Judas Priest uh, uh, podcast with um, listening to George's version, uh, listening to the initial version with George. And that opened up my eyes a lot, seeing it from a different viewpoint, seeing, hearing them with new ears. Uh, I still hate Turbo um, and I still <laughs> am not a defender of the uh, faith in the 80s. I don't like the 80s uh, priest version. It's 70s, 90s and reunion for me. Interesting. Okay. So this is going to be fun then ranking these, ranking these uh, return of Rob era records. I'm really curious how you guys are going to feel about these. So, all right, well, let's 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 jump into this. I think this for me at least this this was a difficult task. I was I was finishing up right before I I we got started here. So so who wants to go first? Who's <laughs> guess you. first? All right, all right, Jay, you could go first. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we we're dealing with five albums here. Uh, so they have to go somewhere. Um, so, just try, all... so everybody knows, let's go through. So when Rob came back into the band, we had Angel of Retribution, yes. Nostradamus, Redeemer of Souls, Firepower, and the most recent album, Invincible Shield. So those are the five albums that did we're talking about. Exactly. So um, we're going to go from uh, least favorite, in yep. quotes, yeah. uh, to our favorite. Uh, and I don't, I don't really have a least favorite. I love all these albums, but... Uh, for the sake of the show, um, we're going to start with Angel of Retribution. Mm. So this album and uh, the reunion came after a time when the Tim Ripper Owens fronted priest was playing small venues. Um, there wasn't really any momentum with priest, uh, no excitement, really. Uh, you, of course, you have all your diehard priest fans. Um but it was kind of waning. Um, and then you had um, the, uh, the, the Halford era, his solo stuff, and he was coming off of the band Halford. Um, and that was kind of waning. He never quite recaptured the magic he had with the album Resurrection. Um, so it, it was it was kind of getting down there. Ripper Owens kind of wanted to do his own thing. Priest management wanted Priest to get back together. Uh, Sharon Osbourne wanted Priest to do Ozfest, uh, with the caveat that they let Rob back into the band. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not saying she had anything to do with it, but uh, KK Glenn and Rob got together to uh, go over the mythology box set. Um, and also, it's interesting, Rob wrote a letter to Priest Management, pouring his heart out, saying he wants back in the band. He never wanted to leave the band. There was miscommunication. Um, so anyway, Priest got back together. They did OzFest. Um, they did a couple other tours. Angel Retribution came out, um, which I was stoked by the time I heard Priest was reuniting with Rob Halford. You know, I was barely hanging on to the bandwagon. Um, Priest was still my favorite band. They've always been my favorite band. Um, but my fandom was kind of waning. Jugulator Demolition really didn't do it for me. I did love the Halford stuff. Uh, so I was kind of skeptical. But, uh, you know, I, I had a lot going on in life, so I wasn't really following 
priest too closely at this time, but uh, I was excited that they reunited, that priest got back together, Angel Retribution came out, um, and I, I think it's a really good record. Of course, you know, the opening track, Judas Rising, uh, which is perfect. Um, just in the name, it's very apropos, Judas Rising, Judas Priest is rising, yeah. they're coming back. Judas Rising. So I think that's a, a a killer first song for the reunion era. Um, and actually KK Downing really wanted uh to name the album Judas Rising, but Ooh. of course he was you know outvoted by uh Glenn Tipton and the manager Jane Andrews, which they have kind of a relationship that uh KK felt that they were really controlling the band and that he had no input which leads to what happens later on but um yeah judas rising great song deal with the devil fun song uh all the references to priest history mm -hmm. um in that song um and uh you know the references to the back catalog uh kind of an 80s vibe to that song uh kind of an 80s vibe or a uh, you know, an older priest vibe throughout the record, which is really cool. Um, you got Hell Rider. Uh, you got that fade in, much like Judas Rising, uh, the double kick, the double bass drum on this one. Uh, kind of, in my mind, kind of muddies the waters for me. I think it's it's kind of unnecessary. And I think, I think uh, Scott does a little too much in that song. And I think he does, he tends to do a little too much in my opinion, every once in a while. Um, but overall it's a strong record, a good variety of songs. Um, you got your face melters, you got your mid tempos. Um, so overall, I think it's, a, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's kind of disjointed in certain places. There's not a good flow to the record um, to me anyway um so some of for some of those reasons i have it last um <clears throat> excuse me in my uh in my five spot here um oh, all right so you'll have to indulge me i'm not good at 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 speaking at, <laughs> at putting at speaking my thoughts without kind of looking at just laughing because he knows i it, I'm not good at, uh, at, at just speaking off the top of my head. I have to put my thoughts down. So if I, if <laughs> I keep awesome. looking down, I, they are my thoughts. They are my <laughs> true thoughts, but, but I, I get all disoriented. If I try to put all my thoughts out at the same time, I get out of order and everything. So anyway, that's why I keep looking down, but, um, uh, I just don't have the smarts or talent to do that. Um, so we're going to go next with firepower. 2018 oh. great record uh uh <laughs> the first to be produced by yeah you're still laughing at me I know. You, you gotta have a poker face here jeff you can't give away like <laughs> <laughs> you can't give away what's your high ranking when you gotta have a poker face like oh okay yeah i think i know jeff enough jeff well enough to know yeah, you guys his, probably his know ranking each other what they're gonna, gonna be, be. Yeah. so yeah. i knew that that was all right so number four i'm a little off kilter Firepower, yeah. Great record. Uh, first one to be produced by Andy Sneap. Um, Tom Allen had a good hand in that, too. Uh, of course, Andy Sneap produced Accept, Opeth, plays Bailey Saxon. You know, the list goes on. So he's great. And, of course, he's uh, the traveling, uh, you know, the concert uh, guitarist, the other guy, taking over for Glenn Tipton. Um, the sound on this record, which I really love, it's really bright. It's real dynamic. Ian's bass in this record just sounds great and thunderous. I do enjoy the production on it. Um, I like the positivity and the brightness of the record, and and that has a lot to do with the songs as long uh, along with the production. Um, there's some patriotism thrown in there with you know never the heroes see a red positivity from rising from ruins no surrender uh richie's guitar playing is really really strong i think he has a little more freedom and comfort in this album uh as opposed to redeemer souls he's a little more comfortable here 
uh, which really comes out. Um, very safe record, though, in my opinion. It's a very safe record. Sounds very corporate at times. I mean, it, it is when you think of a, a great metal record, you know, you want someone to put out, especially Priest, a great metal record. This checks off all the boxes. It is a great metal record but to me it, it's kind of stagnant at times it's a little a little too corporate a little too formulaic at times um you know the 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 title track firepower and lightning strike are probably my least favorite on the album just because of that formula feeling i have um with it i, I just think it's it's kind of too corporate for me great songs but i just I, th I think it's it's an it's a safe formula um so it's it's exactly what you'd think of a metal album um i find scott's drumming on this album to be a bit mechanical at times if that makes sense mm -hmm. um and that that goes on with with the formulaic aspect that i feel this record has um scott just gets in the groove and it's a it's a little mechanical there's not a whole lot of interesting stuff going on not a whole lot of interesting fills um that's just my opinion i could be way off i'm not a drummer or a musician for that matter but that's just what it sounds like to me a little form for formulaic is that a word um i do really like the layering on rob's voice um it kind of really strengthens the voice and kind of puts it out there um really makes it sounds sound big um so for those reasons i i put it here second to last um i think evil never dies flamethrower traitor's gate are some of the standouts for me and i love lone wolf lone wolf is kind of overlooked i think it's a fantastic song it's a little different some might say it doesn't quite fit on the record, but I think it fits perfectly, and it's one of my favorite songs on that record. So, uh, Firepower, 2018. All right, next, we're going to go with Redeemer of Souls, uh, 17th studio album, 2014. Now, I, th I think the songs on this record are much more engaging and interesting to me uh, than Firepower. I just I just find him a lot more engaging to my taste. I also enjoy Scott Travis's drumming on this album. Um, doesn't seem like he's over the top or having mm -hmm. any anything unnecessary. Um, it's kind of straightforward. He's not trying to do too much. And I think in Firepower, sometimes he's trying to do too much. Um, so I think he it's kind of toned down a little bit on this album, which I really appreciate um the production could be a lot better on this album that's that's the only thing that really kind of bugs me um but the strength of the songs i i think make it to where i like it a little better than firepower uh this is produced by glenn tipton um as nostradamus was and we'll get to that one uh but nostradamus has really a fuller sound in my opinion um, mainly because of Don Airy and the keyboards and the arrangements he has in Nostradamus. So out of the two Glenn Tipton albums that he produced, I think um, Nostradamus has a little fuller sound. Um, and I think the production is a little better on that. It sounds like on Redeemer of Souls to me that there's a lot of room for something else. It seems like there's a, there's a channel left open or something to my ears it seems like there's something that can be filled uh in 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 the channel that's not being used i don't know how to explain this but that's what it sounds to me it's it it sounds like there's more room for something and you get that in nostradamus with don airy and his arrangements and everything so i think i'm not saying they should put a bunch of keyboard they should have put a bunch of keyboards in redeemer souls i'm not saying that at all it just seems like there's something missing but again i think the strength of the songs really work uh for me um so this also is the first album with richie faulkner 
So, of course, Richie joined the band after KK left. Uh, he left after the Nostradamus tour. Um, and Priest would tour with Richie on the Epitaph tour before recording Redeemer. Um, so Glenn supposedly had six or seven songs pretty much structured and ready to go for the next album. So Richie really didn't have a whole lot of input. Um, he did during the recording. But during the writing, he maybe didn't have a, a whole lot of input. Um, so, but both uh, Glenn and Rob say that uh, one, you know, once they got recording, um, his participation was invaluable. Uh, he was great to get along with. No more tension in the band. You know, with KK, they KK and Glenn have had tension since, well, the first line of it, you know, really was sin after sin it didn't get any better after that until finally kk left so there's always that struggle that tension within the band um and really during the nostradamus tour it, it was kind of palpable um you could really see they weren't really having too much fun um and i think it was really really getting to um you know the the their live performances, all the tension in the band. So Richie comes, uh, he's instantly comfortable with the band. They are instantly comfortable with him. Um, so all the tension is gone. So you have a, a good cohesive band now. Um, and Richie's performance on the record's outstanding. Um, it might be a little reserved at times, of course, because he came in late, there, there were some songs that were already ready to go. Um, he, he didn't want to overstep his bounds. You know, he didn't want to uh, get, you know, get too invested or or whatever. Of course, he's fully invested. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but he didn't want to overstep his bounds, I guess, being new to the band. Um, so it's it's a little more reserved. But again, I think the strength of the songs really propel this album to where I have it. Um, and like I said, Richie's performance is awesome. A lot of cool little runs, a lot of interesting stuff in most songs. He does add a lot, a lot of extras to the record. Um, Redeemer's a very consistent record. It's really consistent with uh, the songs and the tempos and, and everything. Um, and that's a lot of the reason uh, why I find this a little more compelling than the previous two. Uh, Halls of Valhalla, March of the Damned, uh, Hell and Back are great. And of course, one of the songs I really love is Crossfire. Um, it's kind of out there, kind of different. It's, it's blue. Stop laughing, Jeff. It's uh, bluesy and fun. And I, I just love Crossfire. It's, it's different. You know, like Lone Wolf was different on Firepower, it's different, and I like different. Uh, reminds me of, like, The Rage on British Steel, how that's different, you know. Um, so, Redeemer of Souls. Love that album. So, next, we are going with Invincible Shield. The 2024 release. I love this record. Uh, I like the variety of the songs. I like the ode to the 80s. Um, in a lot of the songs, Devil in Disguise, Gates of Hell, Sons of Thunder, they're all raise your hands in the air, uh, kind of 80s feel to it. There's a lot of 80s feel to this album. Jeff hates the 80s era of Priest, but I love it. Um, so it remind a lot of the songs remind me of that. Uh, I like how introspective Rob's lyrics are. Um, you know, Crown of Horns, Trial by Fire, Escape from Reality. Again, the production is big and dynamic in this one, which I really love. Um, Rob's voice is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think he shows a lot more versatility than on the other reunion, reunion era records. Um, I think he goes into his bag of tricks and he pulls out everything. Uh, you have, you know, the screechy Rob, which I call it's the high pitched Rob, you know, like painkiller saints in hell. I call it the screechy Rob, but it's, you know, he has that high pitched Rob, 
you know, all the way down uh, to his, you know, his regular chest voice and everything in between little gravelly voice here and there. Um, I think Scott Travis on this sounds a little more loose on this record. It sounds like he's having a, a, a lot more fun than on firepower. And like I said, I, I think he sounds a little mechanical and a little corporate on firepower. Whereas this one, I think there are a couple more interesting fills. I think he's, it, it sounds funner. I just made up a word. Sounds funner. Uh, the band sounds like they're having a little more fun, a little more free flowing on this album. Um, and a little less mechanical. Ian Hill is solid and you could really hear it in the mix. Uh, he's always, he's always solid. Richie Faulkner is absolutely fantastic on, on this record. Um, one thing I really miss on this record is like the dueling trade-offs. Um, you know, in, in the solos, it's it's really what Priest is known for, you know, along with the guitar harmonies. Um, it sounds at times like a four-piece band, unfortunately. Um, to me, anyway. One thing I've always loved about Priest uh, is that that stereo sound. You always have Glenn in your right ear, yeah, and you always have KK in your left ear. So you always know who's playing what solo or whatever, besides the difference in style. But, you know, if you're not too familiar with the difference in styles, you always have Glenn in the right ear, KK in the left ear, which if you're at a concert and you're looking at the stage, you have Glenn on the right side yeah. and KK on the left side. So it just fits so magically. Um, and that's that one of the things I really love about Priest. In this record, you're kind of missing that. Uh, in certain aspects, I, I think the production, um, Andy Sneap does a really great job of filling both channels, filling both sides. Um, and there are guitar harmonies and everything else you'd expect from a Judas Priest record. Um, except kind of the, you know, the, the dueling solos, Richie's kind of dueling himself. Um, but you have them, you have them on both channels, um, so the, I mean the the production they did a great job and Richie's a fantastic guitar player. Um, it's just that that dynamic that I miss a little in this record. Um, other than that, it's a fantastic record. You know, after fifty years, the Priest puts out a record like this. It's just yeah. amazing. Rob sounds rejuvenated. Uh, the band sounds rejuvenated. It sounds like they're having fun again. Um, I just love it. Um, Invincible Shield. Nice. And that leaves so, it number one. <laughs> as soon as he said lead? Invincible Shield, everybody went, okay, well, now we know what his number one is. Yeah. Take it yeah. away. Yeah. All right. I have a lot to say. Um, I can tone it down a little, though. Um, probably, obviously, the most controversial album in the catalog um, other than Turbo, probably. Uh, Bill Kerbishley, which is a priest manager, initially brought the concept album idea to the band. Now, Bill had worked on uh, The Wall, or uh, Tommy, you know, The Who's record. Um, so he, he really liked that concept. He brought uh, a couple of ideas to the band. Rasputin was one, which was uh, interesting. Um, and the other was Nostradamus. So they obviously went with Nostradamus. Uh, he was a French astrologer, apothecary, and seer. He wrote uh, 942 poetic quatrains that predicted the future. Uh, I absolutely love this record, obviously, by virtue of where I place it. I think it's a masterpiece. Um, I bought this one on the day of release, and I've loved it ever since. Here's my bad boy right here. One I bought on the day of release. I've loved it ever since. I didn't have any preconceived notions. Uh, of course, if, if you pick up Nostradamus now, you've had years and years of people crapping on it. <laughs> a, a lot, a lot of opinions out there. Um, but I came into it fresh. You know, I came into it with a perspective of it's a, it's a, another priest album. Let's see uh, how it is, and it hit me right off and i love it 
Um, so I had no preconceived ideas in my mind. Um, so I think that really helps. It has everything you'd want in a priest record. It has some fast up tempo, face melters, great riffs, um, melodic mid tempo rockers, great guitar harmony, um, great ballads. The guitar work is absolutely fantastic. I think this is the best guitar work uh, out of the reunion era. Um, the solos on the record are the best of the era. Great trade off solos. Killer technique. The solos fit the atmosphere and the feeling of the songs perfectly. They didn't go overboard. They didn't go, you know, overindulge like a lot of people say they did. Um, but in my eyes, it's perfect, um, especially the guitar work. You have hooky choruses throughout, you have an anthemic song like Alone, um, awesome melodies. Rob's amazing on this record. He displays every technique in the bag, uh, kind of like Invincible Shield. He pulls out every technique in this, uh, and he has so much feeling, uh, which adds to the atmosphere of the record. He has so much feeling in his delivery um, because I think he feels the character Nostradamus quite a bit. Um, so you have you you have the the ear piercing high rob which is you know a staple the high rob um you have the the ballads you know the very gentle rob you have the crooning rob you have the low rob um everything throaty rob like on death i know you love that song jeff um and it's kind of the you know the regular chest rob which is kind of reminiscent uh, of the 80s uh, his voice is epic on this record Don Airy's arrangements are perfect for the songs sounds like a full orchestra at times he does a really great job did a master job I don't think the album would be the same without without Don Airy and his arrangements and how he added to the album um, this may be a little controversial, but I also think Nostradamus, if you follow the timeline and sequencing of Nostradamus, really plays like a Rob Halford autobiography, if you really follow it. Uh, the first couple songs, Prophecy, Awaking, Revelations, the character Nostradamus discovers he's different, wonders if he's crazy, if he's insane. Uh, much like when Rob Halford realizes at a very young age uh, that he's different, you know, that he's gay. He's different. Um, the next handful of songs, War, Pestilence and Plague, Death, Conquest, on the record, predict the hardships and tragedies so society will supposedly, um, that are coming to society, all those challenges and hardships. Uh, Rob in real life, I think foresaw all the hardships and challenges he's going to face from society and religion and everything else by being a gay man. Um, so it follows perfectly. This is the, if you follow the timeline, this is kind of the late seventies and the early eighties when Rob was the metal God, you know, riding a Harley on stage, the symbol of masculinity. Um, he can't come out of the closet because he figures it would ruin the band because this is a different time in society. Uh, the last two songs on disc one, Lost Love, Persecution. On the album, Nostradamus loses his wife and child to the plague, and then he gets persecuted in a sense uh, by the church, by society, um, by society at large. He gets kicked out of university. He gets exiled. Rob Halford at, at this time, same timeline, Rob Halford loses his lover, Brad, to suicide, unfortunately. Um, he enters rehab. He's been sober ever since. And that was 1986 after the uh, Turbo recording. Uh, then in the early 90s, Rob and the band were being persecuted for the suicide death and attempted suicide by the two kids in Reno, Nevada. We can go into that, but um, so he was being persecuted as well. So the timeline is following. Um, and I think that's real interesting. Disc two, 
kind of signals a change in the story with the song Solitude and Exiled. Nostradamus seeks solitude. He's exiled after he's persecuted. Um, Rob Halford in real life wanted a break from Judas Priest to slow down a little and to pursue some solo interests. Priest management took that to mean that he quit the band. Uh, so in essence, he was exiled, exiled from the band. So it follows. Um, and at this time on the record Nostradamus, the character finds himself to be alone because he's different. Um, and he's been shunned by society and religion, but he has a group of marginalized people that accept and applaud him for who he is. Like who is more marginalized than the metal community as well. Um, in real life, this is around the time that Rob comes out of the closet and, you know, on a live interview on MTV. And uh, of course he is at this time accepted. Uh, the next three songs, visions, hope, new beginnings on the record and with Rob are pivotal. Uh, Nostradamus finally accepts who he is. He's comfortable in his own skin. He comes to the realization that this is me. He embraces it. He's comfortable with it. He's also accepted by society. Um, after he fully accepts himself, he's endorsed by Catherine, wife of King Henry II of France. He also meets and marries his second wife, and they have six kids together. So everything's looking great. Uh, in Rob's life, he has visions of getting back in the band if you follow the timeline. In fact, that's why he started the Halford Project, actually, was, you know, coming off the two album or two band, which really wasn't that successful. You thought he kind of sold out or whatever. But the, one of the reasons he started the Halford Band was to show Priest and show Priest management, he admits this in his book, that he can still rock like priest, you know, that he is still the metal God. Um, so he is still the metal God. Um, he started the Halford project. He hopes of getting back in the band and then voila, Rob's back in the band. But right before that, he meets the love of his life, which is Thomas. And they're still partners to this day. He's finally comfortable with his own skin he is finally accepted. He's finally, uh, the, the future looks bright for him. He's moving on. The future looks bright for both Nostradamus and Rob Halford at the same time. Uh, the last two songs say that for both characters that everything's looking good. They both found love. They're both accepted. Uh, the future's bright. Nostradamus has very successful books and quatrains. Um, he's well regarded. Uh, he's fully accepted. He's worshipped by some. And of course, Rob Halford is once again the metal god. So the legend of Nostradamus will live on through his writings. And the legend of Rob Halford will live on through his music. So that's my take on it. It's just a different way of looking at the album if you really follow the timeline and follow what happened in Nostradamus's life and what happened in Rob Halford's life, it kind of reads like a autobiography. And I just think that is so interesting. And I think it just adds to the album uh, a lot. And that really, that really gets me. I, I, I doubt it was intentional, but I always think that it's interesting to interpret an album differently. Um, it just gives a, different aspect to it um and i i really love that that aspect of the storytelling in nostradamus in the album i, I love the album you know i i don't i don't care what anybody says i i love the album always have always will so i have nostradamus um at number one in my reunion oh. era yeah, that was For a great somebody who comes on the show and, and says that they're not a Judas Priest expert, that was a very self-deprecating statement, and you just proved it all to be bullshit. Absolutely. Well, that was amazing. some amazing... Uh, uh, I'm glad you took care of all the facts and everything. I don't have to. That that was that was really great. And your 
interpretation there of Nostradamus. I'd never, never thought of that. And that's just, that's, that's brilliant. It's sort of, I'm already thinking in my head, like, yeah, you know, this, 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 that makes sense. And yeah, yeah, that, well, that was thank great. You. Yeah, thank so I'll hold you. off on when I do my list, I'll, you know, comment on, <laughs> on the albums too, but no, that was great, man. Tons of great facts and uh, yeah. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeff. I saw you kind of every now and then. I saw you rolling your eyes a little bit and trying to co trying to hold your expression back. <laughs> so I have a feeling that uh, you you differ in opinion on on some of these. So give it to us here. Give us your so five to one. Five to one. We I have one agreement with you, Jay. Uh, I have Invisible Shield two, but number five I have Nostradamus. Number four I have Redeemer. Um, number three is angel. Number two is invincible shield. And number one is firepower. So to go over the albums kind of briefly, five Nostradamus. Um, I don't like this album. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> had to, I had to listen to it as part of like my review, my, my refreshing of these five, of these five albums. And it was a slog. It is a very, very bloated album. Um, the songs I do like, Alone, Petulance and Plague, Exiled, I do like the title track. There are some good points to it, but overall it's 80 minutes. It could have been trimmed down to an EP of, of good songs. <laughs> it could have been trimmed down to a seven-inch single. You could have yeah. said that. After Jay just poured his heart out, you go and... <laughs> yeah, so... It could have been trimmed down to a sound bite on uh, YouTube. You know? <laughs> That's why our d dynamic on our priest cast works so well. Yeah, it's like an odd couple thing here. You both yeah, exactly. It, uh, looks at That's great. Though. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, all right. And number Most four, a Redeemer. <clears throat> I, it's also too long, but not quite as bad as Nostradamus. The <laughs> biggest problem I have with this album is the guitar tone. To me, this guitar tone is the same as St. Anger's snare sound. It is that awful that it detracts from everything about wow. the album. Songwriting-wise, it seems like a dry run for firepower. Like, they're trying to put the pieces together with Richie and with uh, Glenn to try and come up with... This just seems like a trial to firepower. Firepower being the much more um, successful album. Uh, Halls of Valh Valhalla and uh, Cold Blooded are two of my favorites off this album. Cold Blooded uh, introduces uh, <clears throat> or makes use of one of my favorite uh, musical tricks, the squealy, the pinch harmonic. Mm. Um, my Dying Bride is one of my favorite bands, and they are mm. notorious for putting a squealy in literally every riff. So to hear that on a priest song it, it, to that degree made me super happy uh jay you mentioned crossfire that is a mess of riffs that don't do anything for me what the hell dude? <laughs> it's bluesy it's it's bluesy and, and it's different yeah that, that's that's why i like it i i like different i like the outlier um and i like the blues what okay can you say uh halls of valhalla is an incredible epic song for some reason the tone doesn't bother me on that um it, the bass on that song in particular is driving. I love that fact. And uh, Rob's opening scream on that track is it just gives me chills. Just brilliant, yeah, brilliant yeah. song. So we'll leave that one and we'll go on to number three, which is Angel of Retribution. When I was first presented with this idea, I had Angel fourth and Redeemer third. And they have switched in my uh, re-listen. Um, I will start off with the most controversial thing. My favorite song on this album is Loch Ness. <laughs> I knew um, that was coming. Finally, somebody gives Loch Ness some love. <laughs> that song is like that's the Nostradamus before no, no, actually, uh, yeah, Nostradamus before Nostradamus. <laughs> Which is <laughs> weird because so I, I'm I'm a doom metal fan. I love long yeah, so songs. I. So it's kind of weird that Nostradamus ir irritated me so much, but Loch Ness is just perfect. It it's atmospheric, it's got riffs, it's got emotion dri uh, just dripping off it. I love it so much. And talk about pinch harmonics. There's a little bit of that. Dee, 
right right that little thing in that which i i love that exactly um uh, deal with the devil i think is a great song d demonize is a great song hell rider is a great song i think you mentioned these as well when you were doing your list of what you liked off this album jay um but i really don't like revolution and worth fighting for has some of the rob's worst lyrics they're just inane to me they don't do anything for me i would agree with that all right so that was number three number two is the most recent invincible shield um this album has stuck with me uh it's one you know it's been out for six months now or something and less but yeah close uh, enough yeah mm-hmm. um it stuck with me it it, it wasn't like oh i listened to it like it and then forget about it uh, it actually has kept with me one it has one of my favorite uh priest songs ever escape from reality which is a such a sabbath a worship song i love it i um, love that song yep couple problems with it i think there's like four motorcycle songs about uh songs with motorcycles <laughs> on it. and that, uh, um and and Oh, the, the coolest thing about Invincible Shield, like at, from an objective viewpoint, the coolest thing about it is it has 70s elements, it has 80s elements, it has 90s elements, it has modern elements. Uh, so right. all of Priest is represented on Invincible Shield, all of them in good right. ways. The 80s track, the 80s sounding tracks like uh, Giants to the Sky and Sons of Thunder and Crown of Horns, they fall weak for me. So I'm going to skip them when I'm listening to it. But they're not terrible songs. They're just not my... Uh, what i would like um and then number one is firepower and i'll just be real brief about this it's awesome every single track (laughs) except for lone wolf jay what's the matter with you hey (laughs) same thing it's different it's it's an outlier it's different love it yeah so as i was uh, listening to him i took notes my one note on lone wolf was not terrible but seems out of place so true true and i love it yep uh (laughs) traitor's gate is fantastic never surrender is amazing necromancer might be the heaviest song they've ever done um it really is uh firepower is most the most similar to painkiller which i is my favorite priest album firepower is the most similar to it therefore i love it the most of these all right we've got a nice like variation between all of our lists here none of us really landed the exact same way all right i'm gonna start i'm gonna start off by saying like jay said at the beginning i like all these records uh whenever i do lists everybody whatever is at the bottom of my list oh you hate that record no i don't hate that record this is just in the context of these five records this is how it lands i don't Probably, mind saying i hate no so Right. All right. Probably my most (laughs) controversial pick here is going to be my number five. And it's the latest one, Invincible Shield. And I'm going to maybe give myself a little escape hatch and say, well, it's the most recent one and I haven't had as much time to, to live with it. But and I feel terrible because I remember everybody seemed to love this record and I do like the record. But the problem that I have with the record, and I mentioned this in my review of it when it first came out, is that there's too much of the same thing. There's too much of this kind of fast, painkiller style thing. There's not enough variety in the tempos and the songs for me. And I also think, and I don't know if you guys can confirm this, I think, Jay, you might have mentioned it at, at one point that it's like Richie Faulkner versus Richie Faulkner you know, going on with the dual guitars. And I I never thought of that, but I, in my mind, I was thinking there wasn't enough variety between the guitars. The guitars sound too much the same to me. Uh, the production of it, if anybody who watches my channel, they hear me rant about the loudness wars and things that are over compressed. And this record is too compressed for me. It's fatiguing on my ears. The guitars are too like, samey didn't somebody use that word somewhere or, or funner or you said funner i'm gonna is samey a word <laughs> that's gonna be my word samey it's just they're just kind of one sound through the whole record so in the production of it it's just kind of fatiguing to me that doesn't mean there aren't songs i don't like on it i like panic attack the serpent and the king 
Invincible Sh Invincible Shield. I also don't like the title of this record. It's like almost hard for me. It's like a tongue twister or something for me to say Invincible right. Shield. Uh, love Crown of Horns. Didn't care for that when I first heard it, but I love where it sits on the record. I really love The Lodger. Uh, Draw by Fire. I like that one too. But for me, it's kind of the production and there's just not enough variety on this album for me. It's too much of that fast roughly the same tempo if i had the patience i would sit down and mark out the tempos of these songs there's just too many of them that are just kind of at that like you know just that that fast kind of hitting you hard all the time type of thing okay number four uh thought this one might land a little higher on my list because i did i do this thing every now and then called in defense of and i did an in defense of nostradamus and so I kind of thought it would land higher on my list, but it didn't. And I like it for a lot of the reasons that, that you mentioned, Jay. It's definitely different. As I said in my In Defense video, I applaud Judas Priest for, you can say that, okay, this fell flat. They missed the mark, all that stuff. The safe thing at this point in time for Judas Priest to do would have been to just put out a standard by the numbers Judas Priest record. So for them to do this, and this is certainly not a commercial thing, like if they had come out and done like three minute songs like they were trying to get on the radio, this is not that. A concept record about Nostradamus that's, you know, an hour and 40 minutes long or however long it is, that is not a, a, a you know, let's just try to cash in and have an easy record, maybe get some radio airplay or whatever. It doesn't do any any of those things. So I do think that they were genuinely into this, that this was an artistic decision, the reason why they did it. It wasn't any kind of cash grab or easy way out type of thing. My problem with the album, though, and it's kind of funny because, Jay, you seem to really like these elements of the record. I really wish that they had... It sounds like the string sounds are all sampled in keyboards, it, at times, it sounds to me like it's a drum machine going on at moments. And I really wish, and maybe there just wasn't the budget in whatever year this album came out, the budget wasn't there to hire an, a real orchestra, to hire a real choir. And Definitely. I was really hoping, I remember and I, uh, at the time I was reading uh, uh, Martin Popoff's Judas Priest's Heavy Metal Painkillers. And that book ends right before Nostradamus comes out. But it talks about Nostradamus, like they're planning on doing this. I think they even might have had the title at that time. And I remember finishing that book and being so excited. And although I like Nostradamus, and when I got it, it really got into it, listened to it a lot. I just don't like the production of it. It's It sounds to me... I really wish they could have, and I think that they had dreams of doing this, going out on the road and performing the entire record. This entire yeah. record with an orchestra behind them and a choir behind them. Yeah. Otherworldly. But the way it stands here, it, it, it sounds again like there's a drum machine. It sounds like this was maybe Glenn Tipton might have done this in a home studio and they were just flying tracks in. It's way too stiff for me. And the keyboard sounds, which shocks me because Don Airy is, is in a, I love Don Airy, but the keyboard sounds sound dated on here to me. Like someone was using outdated keyboard stuff. Uh, so for that reason, it drags it down for me. I would give anything for them. I, I'm hoping that in my lifetime, Nostradamus is going to be one of these records that has a rebirth like people rediscover it and it becomes this record this cult classic record and then the band goes out and they perform it with an orchestra and a choir and a whole thing because i think it would have just from beginning to end in a setting with rob maybe changing costume like a theatrical show almost would just be absolutely amazing but as it stands it it, it lands at uh, number four for me Okay, let me move up my notes here. Number three is Firepower. I like Firepower, but there's just some songs on here that that just don't do anything for me. It just come up a little short. Those songs would be Sea of Red, Lone Wolf, Flamethrower, No Surrender. Really like Lightning Strikes. Love Evil Never Dies. I love the chorus in that song. 
Never yeah. the Heroes is good. Necromancer, you're, uh, Jeff, I think you said it, is super heavy. Love it. Children of the Sun, great chorus. Rising from the Ruins, I like Trader's Gate. I like Spectre. But it just like the end of this record kind of runs out of gas a little bit for me. And and those songs that I mentioned earlier are just a little forgettable for me. I also like the title track, Firepower. Uh, so that lands it at number three for me. All right, uh, number two, uh, Redeemer of Souls. I, I was, I'm shocked that there's a lot of people that don't like this record. I've always liked this record. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a problem with the, with the production on it, although I do kind of get where where I think Jeff, where you're coming from with this. Love Dragonaut. Uh, love the title track, Redeemer of Souls. Halls of Valhalla is great. Sort of. Damocles, I love the chorus in that. Uh, March of the Damned is great. Uh, it's got some mid-tempo things on it. Again, this is something, this, with Invincible Shield, it almost feels like they become locked into like everything has to sound like painkiller and it has to be fast and aggressive. I like when Priest does the slower tempo stuff. So like Hell and Back, Cold Blooded, they're kind of mid-tempo. Yes. I love those. Metalizer, fast and aggressive, really like that. Secrets of the Dead has an epic feel that I like. Battle Cries, like classic fast priest. And I love Beginning of the End. They end the record with kind of a real moody uh, ballad, which I think was a brave thing to do. Right. Okay, that leaves it number one for me, Angel of Retribution. Maybe it was the excitement of the reunion. Uh, Ozzy rejoins Sabbath. Bruce comes back into Maiden. It just seemed inevitable that Rob was going to come back to Priest. I remember being really excited for this record. And I, it could have been really corny, all the references to older Judas Priest songs, but it works on here for me. It, it, it Because it's done in a way like they're tipping their hat to the classic Priest, but they're also moving on type of thing it's like a reverence for the back catalog a respect for the for the older catalog judas uh judas is rising i mean what a great co chorus uh what a great way to start the record i like how it has kind of like a different feel the way the double bass drums and everything in the verse i love revolution it reminds me of uh like take on the world and united that kind of like crowd soccer stadium chanting kind of thing and again it's got this different kind of beat here uh uh ian hill i'm glad you guys gave ian hill so much love here and shouted him out uh during, during your thing here because he doesn't get enough uh he doesn't get enough love i remember reading a review of i forget which one of these newer priest records and they're like rob halford brings his screams and and richie faulkner brings this and scott travis brings this and ian hill does whatever it is that he does that keeps him in the band <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not <laughs> but fair. I love the way not he fair. starts that off with the ba with the distorted bass, and it's just got that kind right. of sing along stadium sing along thing that that, that just I, I like that uh, deal with the devil, demonizer. Uh, then you've got the different temple, the slower things like angel and eulogy. I think are just I love an angel the way again he references the old like sad wings of destiny and everything and Lochness. Jeff, I'm glad you shout out. I'm a doom metal fan. I've always liked Loch Ness. It's slow. It's heavy. I know the chorus is a little goofy. You can almost picture like a Broadway show. Loch Ness, Loch Ness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> da, 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 da. You know, right guys holding their beers yeah. up in the air. You know, we don't <laughs> talk about that part. <laughs> yeah, right. you know they're like in a bar or something you know everybody's sort of chan chanting along they'll see you of the death you know and that is a little bit much i admit that that pushes pushes it a little bit but i love the way that song fades there's a there's a point in the song where it's fading out and there's a guitar doing it's like jump jump Doom, doom, like thing you know and it's like a little bit out of time and it's oh man that's just fantastic I, I love it so this album maybe it's a time period thing again rob's back in the band uh just the excitement of the whole thing the 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 feeling of older classic priests yet not sounding like they're copying themselves you know, you can sort of take a bunch of these songs and sort of okay that's kind of like this is but it's not like they're copying shamelessly copying old priest it did really feel like kind of a step forward it's just to me there's a lot of energy 
on the record. Uh, again, I love the references to, to the old and the classic songs in the lyrics. Rob sounds amazing. Uh, I, I just always love this, this record. And again, maybe it's just a nostalgia thing because I was so excited for them to be back together. But uh, I just return to it often and love it. So that's my number one, Angel of Retribution. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, this this was a great, great exercise. Uh, it was so cool because we all kind of came at it from, from different angles. We all had different... I don't think any of us had the same number one. Uh-uh. -oh pick nope. did we need none of us either had the same number five pick so that was that was pretty cool that we all had different different uh, feelings and opinions on it so this was great uh you got a little taste of how knowledgeable these guys are about judas priest uh with with jay with your stuff there the facts and everything and that was fantastic well that's what you get in their podcast everybody it's a lot of fun the the uh, Jeff and Jay, their different opinions the guests that they have on the history and everything that they share so I really encourage everybody Check out the uh, Judas Priest cast. Uh, Spotify. It's on Spotify and Apple and a bunch of all the other streaming services. I'm going to be leaving links down below in the description uh, for their Facebook page and where you can also just get more information about the podcast and everything. So make sure you go out and you check out their podcast. Guys, thank you so much for doing this. This is a blast. Hopefully you'll want to come back and we can, uh, you know, maybe Turbo. Maybe we can talk about Turbo. <laughs> or uh, we'll pick some other that that might be a fun fun one to get into to you know what is is we'll we'll leave it we'll leave it for that episode but thanks again guys <laughs> yeah. I, I, thanks for joining me here at the lair and for our first episode of rank them if you got them this was really a blast so thanks guys thank, thank you, you. So it was great all right and uh like i like to say at the end of the shows till we see you again make sure you stay heavy stay metal